This will be the last, final, closing, ultimate year of the Marketplace of Ideas. Unless, of course, we can reach 10,000 podcast subscribers by the end of 2011. Now, you might already know this goal. You might not. For more details, it's ColinMarshallRadio.com. But it boils down to this. We'll need 377 more subscribers this week alone to stay on track to reach 10,000 by the end of the year and survive on to 2012 and beyond, giving you more cultural conversation of the depth you demand. We're going to need your help on this. I think that's what it's coming down to. So if you want to find out ways you can assist the show in reaching 10,000 by the end of 2011, subscribe to the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list. Go to ColinMarshallRadio.com, click the Marketplace of Ideas logo there on the front page. You'll find very simple details on how to do that and how to help ensure that the Marketplace of Ideas keeps on going, keeps on delivering all the interviews you want to hear. Thanks. There's one sensation that I want you to describe more from everything that you've written about Japan, whether it's in print or online or what have you. What does it actually feel like to travel through the streets of Osaka by bicycle? <laughs> um, it's a rush. I think the first time uh, when I arrived here in November of last year, the first thing I did was I went across the street from my house to a, a shop run by a little old lady and bought a bicycle for about $60, a kind of shopping bicycle with a big basket on the front. And um, I can still remember the really intense feeling of... Uh, pleasure and freedom rushing along above the ground uh, on this bicycle and uh, the paving on the streets in Japan is much smoother than it is elsewhere especially in my hometown of Edinburgh in Scotland which has cobbles and hills it's a bit like San Francisco it's really difficult for bicycles and also really bad traffic and you're not allowed to ride on the sidewalks here you can you can ride on the sidewalks you can take either side of the road. It doesn't really matter. You can basically, you negotiate at every corner with a whole host of other cyclists. Nobody wears helmets. Uh, the bicycles have this lightness and precision, which means that they roll almost frictionlessly along these really smooth pavings. And the whole city is kind of like a big flat grid. It reminds me of New York in that sense, that it's really uh, just a huge grid. So it's kind of difficult to get lost. On the one side, you, you have the mountains, uh, that's on the east side of the city, hemmed in with mountains. On the west side, you've got the docks and then the Osaka Bay. And then you've got north and south. And you can go, if you go north far enough, you get to Kyoto. And if you get south far enough, you get to Wakayama. So I just spent a lot of time exploring on, on the bicycle. And I found it really exhilarating. From KCSB in Santa Barbara and Colin Marshall Radio, I am Colin Marshall. This is the Marketplace of Ideas, and we have a return guest on the program today, Nick Curry, also known as Momus, who you can tell is not in Berlin anymore, where he was when we spoke last. Now he's in Osaka, Japan, and it's it's fortuitous because he has a new book out, the second book he's written for Sternberg Press's Solution series, where before he wrote Solution 11 through 167, the Book of Scotland's, now it's Solution 214 through 238, the Book of Japan's. And of course, this accompanies another album he's got out this year, Thunderclown. It's been a very productive period. Now, d tell me, I suppose, I want to know first why you've done a lot lately. Why Why this seeming surge in productivity? Um, I think it's partly because I stopped blogging. Yes, as we discussed last time you were on the show, the entire subject was you quit Click Opera. Yeah, that's right. And, and so I, I, I've always had a lot of sort of energy and I just always like to be working on a project. And so um, the blog for a while became like my main occupation. And uh, and it was a very enjoyable kind of symposium that I did every day with people. And the comments were great. Everyone was really smart. And But I got a bit bored with my own opinions. And blogging is a lot to do with opinion. So I'm much more interested in speculation and I think what's called, called sociological science fiction, uh, you know, where you imagine parallel worlds and try to figure out other ways people could live. And uh, so I've been doing that in the books and also in the um, the records, although the, the new album is more like a retro kind of hauntological investigation of the 1950s and former 
musical styles because we were using a lot of samples from old records and old vinyl and um, and making new songs out of them. And when when we last talked, we the, the conversation just sort of ineb- inevitably went toward Japan. And as I recall, we talked about the question you had asked yourself uh, of whether or not you could live in Japan. I mean, we know the answer now that you can, but at that time, I mean, did you know you were headed there? Well, I had lived in Japan about 10 years ago. I lived in Tokyo for uh, one year, um, often on sort of alternating between New York and Tokyo. So I, I, I knew I could do it, but I, I knew that there are, there are setbacks and drawbacks and flip sides to it. Um, you feel, or I, certainly I feel quite isolated here um, because I don't speak Japanese to any really high standard. And um, I kind of enjoy the outsiderdom and the, the exoticization both of myself as a foreign element here, a fly in the milk, uh, but also of uh, Japanese culture and the, the way that I don't ever quite grasp it. And I kind of don't ever want to quite grasp it. I want that mystery to remain intact. And in that sense, Japan is like a, a work of art or something. It's like something that intrigues you and perplexes you in, um, in a good way. In, in the book, in the new book, in the book of Japan's, you have this cast of Japanophiles who are well. I shouldn't put it so. I shouldn't put it in such fine terms. But you do. You have people interested in Japan or who talk a lot about the subject of Japan and speculate about it. And this this difference, I suppose, in reading you write about Tokyo versus reading you write about Osaka or post about it as you do occasionally on a, on a Tumblr blog. Now, you know, I. I, as a Japanophile myself, I admit that Osaka has fascinated me much more than Tokyo has, and I don't quite know why. But what 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 could you tell us about Osaka that that sets it apart quickly in in one's mind from Tokyo? It's more, more um, crazy and extrovert. It's sort of known as the Latin city of Japan. So people are people really love eating and drinking and socializing. They're noisier, they're more hedonistic. Um, a lot of them are poorer. Uh, I live close to a really poor area, which was traditionally called Nishinari, and they've tried to change the name because there was a lot of stigma around the name. But then now there are actually rappers, Japanese rappers called uh, things like Shingo Nishinari, who, <laughs> who talk about the ghetto, you know, and talk about this as Japan's ghetto. And it is really, it's the poorest slum in Japan. And, uh, and I go there pretty much every day and I buy you know, really cheap secondhand clothes there. And I, I love soaking myself in the, the show atmosphere because basically everything feels like it did 20 years ago, 30 years ago in that area. The cinemas still have painted posters, hand painted uh, for the movies. And there are little kabuki theaters that blast out really high volume uh, soundtracks. Uh, there are a lot of crazy disabled and homeless people, uh, day laborers, foreigners, kind of you know, murderers on the run. This notorious murderer lived in Nishinari for a long time until he was arrested trying to escape to Okinawa. So um, it has a... But Osaka in general, I mean, it's a big commercial city with a lot of commercial energy as well. Um, I guess it's just deep Japan in a sense that Tokyo is not because on, on every street corner or on every block in Tokyo, you see foreigners and it's a little bit like a global city like London or New York. Not quite like that but it is for japan it's more like a world city in tokyo this this neighborhood nishinari there's there's a lot i want to know about it and i guess first i'll i'll bring up this phenomenon which seems to me to be true which is that here in the u.s we have of course very rich areas very poor areas everything in between as well but our poor areas can be interesting they can be boring they can sort of be whatever it seems in japan the poorer a neighborhood gets the more the more interesting it seems i may just be looking at this through your lens of what you what you the photos you post and whatnot but do, i mean do you see that phenomenon well what's really great is that it's very safe so i i feel safe to just walk anywhere in nishinari although there are you know there are yakuza people very obviously um patrolling the streets and there are um you know this drug dealing and stuff going on there just like there would be in a really sketchy neighborhood in the West, but uh, you never have the same degrees of danger. Uh, so I think it's, um, it can be more picturesque. I mean, this whole area is, a, is problematical because um, you can romanticize the life of the poor, especially if you're not as poor yourself. Uh, and everything's 
tied up with relative deprivation, what they call relative deprivation, where you, you know, if you're slightly better off than some people, you feel as rich as a king kind of thing. I think it's really notable, though, that in Japan, um, there is much more equality uh, than there is generally in the West, in, in certainly in America and Britain. These are very, very unequal societies and getting more so. And Japan continues to be uh, like it's the second, according to UN statistics, it's the second most equal society in the world. So um, that means that the, the gap between the rich and the poor is really not that great. So even the poorest neighborhood, it's still very tidy. It's got well-paved roads. You know, the buildings stand up even in an earthquake. Uh, it's not like Haiti where everything's going to collapse. And, you know, it's, it's, it's different. So you have a... And, of course, then you get back to the whole question of equality. Um, maybe Japan is only equal because they haven't allowed any immigrants in, you know, and it gets very problematical because, uh, you know, this kind of equality is a bit like a family that's put up, a you know, a gated community around its house. And um, it's, it, it, it's, it's just because of the restriction on immigration that they have this degree of equality. And in the click opera days, it's... I remember a lot of this where you would you would post an appreciation of some element of Japan, but then you would rush in a sense to undercut that appreciation or to put up some questions that might that might make the appreciation seem more questionable. I mean, is that the pattern of thought you think you have about Japan? Yeah, I mean, I think always my underpinning impulse is one of love and admiration and fascination with this society, which continues to be the most different society in the world. It's it, Somehow it's survived into an advanced technological society with all sorts of values intact, which are really ancient values and which go back to a tribe worshipping the sun, you know, uh, the sun goddess Amaterasu and the whole Shinto religion is still very present here. And in ways which which we don't have in the West, because we Christianity really stamped out our pagan religions, which were in themselves agrarian, sun worshiping religions. So that kind of thing fascinates me. But you know, at the same time, if you're going to talk about Shinto, you would have to talk about the downside of Shinto, which is that there was a period of fascism in the mid 20th century where the state, the fascist state in Japan, appropriated the Shinto religion and made it into something called state Shinto which um, was obviously not a positive development for either Shinto or for Japan. So, um, yeah, there are always downsides. I want to know, was any, was any of the Book of Japan's written in Japan? Did you do any of the writing for this there? No, it was written entirely in Berlin, and it's set entirely in Scotland, except right. for the very end when, when my um, protagonists crash in, into the, the crater of Mount Fuji. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, and I suppose we should build up to that now it, it is set entire i, I think i think all is specifically in shetland right yeah which is extremely northerly the most northerly part of the british isles um the islands at the very it's sort of in between the faroes or iceland and, and scotland it was a treeless landscape which i visited with my mother on a on a trip in um 2008 and it really stayed with me as a as a location as a place i, I wanted to do something with imaginatively and there's there's a what, what to call it you know, we have the Book of Scotland's. We had that first from you, and it, it essentially operated as, as, as a list of speculative Scotland's. Um, some of the writing about about the the various Scotland's in that book, you know, I recognized as statements about Japan from from click opera with Scottish geography slotted in there, and that was fascinating to me. But now, I mean, there's there's a step up in form for the Book of Japan's because, of course, it is what what somebody would call a quote unquote proper novel. You know, it's it's there's a central narrative, and there's there's twelve. Japan experts you have as characters, 12 idiots who have seen Japan, allegedly, by climbing into the wombs of cows, and uh, the one group faces the other to determine who's telling the truth, who's been to Japan, what's what's going on here. And I I want to know how, how I guess you got to that, that organizing structure for a book that on some level is similar to the Book of Scotland's, but this is just a, a new way to, to look at it. Yeah, it's a continuous narrative, and the Book of Scotland's is great for reading in, on the toilet, um, because <laughs> Uh, you can every time you go in there, you can read a different self-contained little uh, narrative. But uh, I, I did want to tie them all together, and, and um, I suppose a bigger narrative is just it just comes out of the. Well, it, it allows me to develop a, an ongoing uncertainty about who are the experts and who are the idiots, which is really the central um, comic motif of the novel. That, that I'm fascinated by these self-appointed. Sinologists and Japanologists, the people who explain uh, the East to the West. And um, I wanted to, 
I would, not necessarily to say that they were idiots, but to say that they were in a way speculative, just like the, the fiction itself is speculative. They write in the margins. I mean, in a way, it's a double margin because you have the people who talk about the future who are always um, obviously speculating. And then you have the people who talk about Japan and explain Japan to the West. And they're also speculating because both the future and Japan are in a sense unknowable to the West. I think with our mental apparatus, we just, we don't have the capacity to, to understand a society as different as a future society or, or Japan. So I wanted to mix up over, over a longer uh, kind of narrative, mix up, um, delirious delusions about Japan and projections uh, with uh, so-called accurate expert views. And, and that's what uh, this, this long form allows me to do. And while reading the book, I, I thought to myself, I thought of the book as, as yeah, a satire in a sense on, on the, the, the place of the Japan expert in the West. I mean, not satire as in a needling sort of thing, but I, I look at the Japan experts, this cast of 12, and certainly I see qualities in them that remind me of, of writers that I like to read, of writers that I maybe like to read more than I want to like to read, if you know what I mean. Um, it's, there's, there's, characters who remind me of, of guys like Donald Ritchie or, or Donald Keene, whose names are also brought up in the book. I mean, these, the important thing, and I want to know more about this, is that you have kind of satirical Japan experts coexisting with people that would seem, that, that seem like they provide the material of the satire. You know, the, the real people exist in the universe of the Book of Japan, don't they? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, I mean, some of them, their names kind of sound a little bit like people like Ritchie and Keene. Um, yeah, I wanted there to be established Japan experts who were sort of semi-recognizable in there, but also that, 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 that you could um, refer to the real Japan experts out there and quote them. And uh, So it is, it's a dangerous mixture of fact and fiction in a sense. I'm sure there's not going to be any lawsuits. I, I very much hope not. What has been your relationship to, to the work of, of people like a Donald Keane or a Donald Ritchie or an Alex Carr or I mean, people like this just in life? Have you... In, in your relationship with Japan, has has this work, the stuff these people write, been of actual use to you, or has it been something to define yourself against, or how have you worked with that? Oh yeah, well I like Richie very much. I think he's great, and I love the way that he he sort of mixed his personal observations and and quite risque anecdotes yes. about his personal life with um, with his cultural observations, because I think that a lot of us experience Japan that way as a passionate interest in particular Japanese people. Um, but also those people become cultural ambassadors and guides to us and lead us step by step into the culture. But it's, it's an unfolding revelation that takes a very long time and we never get to the end. of. I mean, Keen, Keen is very uh, old now, so he's been around. He's been doing it longer than any of us since the Second World War. Um, but someone like Alex Kerr I have much more problems with because I, I get very tired of hearing the same criticisms that Japan is all just concrete and et cetera, et cetera. He's very much a traditionalist, an esthete. Um, he's built his own um, beautiful retro Japanese tea house or his house in the country is, um, is an unspoilt vision of an ancient Japan, which all of us love, of course, but some of us also love the concrete and love the modernity. And I think it's very important to say that, um, Modernity is not westernization. I, I don't agree with those people who say that Japan has um, has ruined itself by westernizing, uh, I, I, because the, a lot of things that look like Western um, technology and Western architecture are actually very Japanese, the way they're built and the way they're experienced here. I don't, and I, I think especially now that the West is on the wane, uh, modernization is not westernization you can be modernizing in a chinese way now for instance the way you build buildings is uh, much faster than anything we ever did in the west in china so modernization is now asianization and speaking of of donald of donald ritchie you know i i've read his his japan journals a few times it's one of my favorite books and in the journals he he writes about a few conversations he has with similar similarly 
uh, anointed Japan experts, and I, mean, I believe Alex Kerr is one of them, where he, he has conversations where he says, you know, are we, why are we in this country? Why, why, why have we made this our life? Donald Ritchie proposes that perhaps it stems from an attraction to Japanese people. And this is Donald Ritchie. So when he says, says attraction, he's being very, fairly open about the sort of sexual nature of that. And there's something about that that I, I can imagine somebody reading that and saying, what? You, you did all this just because you happened to like the, the look of a Japanese man naked, you know. But I, I, I personally love the idea that somebody would have this enormous career, this enormous intellectual career based on an erotic impulse. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. And all my favorite um, writers and thinkers have been people who mix the personal, the political, uh, the um – the public life with the private life. I mean, people like Georges Bataille or, you know, Serge Gainsbourg. I think there always has to be a strong, a strong sexuality and, and a sense that the passion and intellect are not are not distinguishable, really. That It's all right to be passionately intellectual, intellectually passionate. It's all right to mix your personal life with your public life. And I think Richie is... I mean, I'm disappointed that he, he bottled out at the last moment and disconnected the sexual memoir from the rest of his memoirs and he's promising he's promising to publish the sexual memoir at some future point possibly not until after he's dead unfortunately but uh, uh, yeah i think his editors his publishers recommended that he separated out which i think is a great shame just tuning in this is the marketplace of ideas and i'm colin marshall my guest coming back on the program for a return visit is musician artist and writer nick curry better known as momus He's talking about his new book, The Book of Japan's, which follows up The Book of Scotland's. These are the pair of books he's written for Sternberg Press's Solution Series. If you want to hear this conversation again after it's over, visit ColinMarshallRadio.com and get it as a podcast or get any other interview the show's ever done, by the way, as a podcast. You can also get those on iTunes, open up the iTunes store, and search for The Marketplace of Ideas. There is a weekly Marketplace of Ideas email newsletter as well. You can sign up for that at colinmarshallradio.com. Go to the Marketplace of Ideas front page, follow the oh-so-very-simple instructions, and you'll get weekly updates on all things Marketplace of Ideas. Now back to the conversation with Nick Curry, also known as Momus, on the Marketplace of Ideas, cultural conversation of the depth you demand. Do you think that when somebody is presented as an expert on something and they they give their views with the implication of that of course these views on my subject of expertise are completely divorced from my aesthetic impulses from my sexual impulses if they imply that do you think that they must be lying um i think they're being boring selective uh-huh. and uh, often keeping their good name in mind and um, there are a lot of the kind of people who report to Washington think tanks about the rise of China's economic and military strength etc etc obviously those guys are never going to endanger their positions and their, their pompousness is never going to be undermined by uh, by saying oh, oh and by the way I love Chinese women or <laughs> you know because you you just then enter in huge debates with people who, who think that's improper. Now, to get back to the actual to the actual narrative of the book of Japan's, you know this, the the, the fantastical Japan's that these these Shetland idiots, as they're called, uh, come up with, they're 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 very. I don't want to say that they're similar in in content to the speculative Scotland's, but was how similar was the. Uh, form is not quite the right word, but in your own speculation about Scotland's, in your own speculation about Japan's to make these books, I mean, was it the same kind of speculation you were tapping into within yourself? Yeah, I think so. I think um, it's basic cultural relativism, cultural relativism 101, because uh, once you get out of the the, uh, culture you were born in and start experiencing other cultures, It relativizes everything. It relativizes the place you came from and the ways you thought were the natural way to do things suddenly are not so natural. So whether I'm looking at my own society or or another society, just the fact that I've knocked around in a lot lot of different cultures in different countries, and it's not just Japan and the West, it's uh, also places sort of interestingly in between them, like Greece, when I was a kid, that was the first foreign country we lived in under the 
the fascist colonels, actually, under the military junta. So that was a different system of government, a different feeling of life, a different a Mediterranean way of being. So that was the first thing. that, And I was reading writers like Lawrence Durrell, at that, or, or Gerald Durrell, rather, at, at the age of 10 or so, uh, Lawrence Durrell, not till later. Um, and they were dealing with, and it was still very exotic in their time, in the mid-20th century, quite exotic to be a British person living abroad and writing from a a perspective that wasn't based in Britain. So um, I guess that was the beginning of it. But it is basically everything becomes, um, everything is open for rewriting the moment you realize that things are just arbitrary, that cultural rules are just arbitrary. So it's a little bit like maybe the early days of the internet or something. You realize that society is itself a writable script that you can get in. If you have the coding skills, you can get in and start recoding it. And at what point did you first realize this is sort of point of first contact that had you realize that you you found something in the way that japan had coded its society well i started coming here in the 80 in the early 90s but um in the 80s i, I had had my first japanese girlfriend uh, junko i guess who, in london i met her and she she had a it wasn't so much that she was telling me about japanese society as that she was um enthusing about Jean Cocteau and uh, Godard and, you know, French people. And I hadn't met many British people who were actually big fans of Cocteau and Godard, strangely enough, in Britain. <laughs> there's still a sort of ressentiment against French culture in Britain. There's a kind of uh, competition, rivalry, separation, specialization between Britain, especially England and France. So I was having to hang out with Japanese people to actually uh, share my enthusiasm for people like Jean Cocteau. And I thought, that's really interesting. Why is Jean Cocteau traveling all those thousands of miles to Japan so easily, culturally speaking, and yet not crossing the English Channel, which is just 25 odd miles? So um, that was really where my interest began. But, I, you know, there are so many notional start points for it. I could I could say, you know, that I met a Buddhist monk when I was seven or eight on a Scottish island, which is true. I thought until recently this had been a Japanese monk, but I was told, my mother told me actually he was a, he was a Tibetan Buddhist. So, oh. so that was one of the things, one of the anecdotes I was always telling was that I met this monk who had perhaps um, infiltrated my, my mind with uh, propaganda about how great Japan was. Turns out it was a Tibetan, so I should have, by that theory, I should have ended up in Tibet. But it makes it more interesting almost that, that he, the Tibetan monk, was the one that contributed to a love of Japan. Do you know what I mean? A Japanese monk, that's too predictable. Well, it's, that's rationalization after the fact, actually, because I was just trying to think back to what possible start point there might have been for this. I mean, I, I wrote this song when I was seven uh, called I Can See Japan, which is kind of based on the who's I can see for miles. And uh, I just thought, well, hey, I can see one better than miles. I can see all the way to the other side of the world where there is this island that is kind of shaped a bit like Britain and has sort of the same kind of advanced civilization but it's totally different in every way so i don't know I, at some point i must have just been become aware of japan the interesting thing is i have a nephew now who's sort of into animation he's like 18 years old and he's also hugely into japan but i think in with his generation he had a lot more opportunities to to find out about japan than i did I don't recall Japan being on TV ever. We didn't really, there weren't even bought in mangas or animations on British television in the 1960s when I would have been watching it. So I really don't know where it started. I want to get more into this idea. You mentioned the similarity of shape somewhat or size between between Britain and, and Japan. And I notice myself, and this is not unique to me, but uh, thinking about the music I listen to or the things I read or watch, so many so many either come from Britain or Japan. It's always Britain or Japan whenever I look into something that I enjoy. And, you know, when I'll have even even some of the anointed Japan experts you mentioned in the book, the real ones, I've had a couple on this show, and some, some will even say, well, they'll, they'll, they'll evoke maybe some sort of deep similarities or deep sympathies between Britain and Japan. Uh, I want to know if you credit the idea of those existing. Yeah, very much so. I think um, there's something to do with feeling like you're an appendage because an island at the edge of a continental landmass is an appendage. It's kind of an afterthought. And it's also kind of a place that is really perfectly set up for filtration. You know, when you have a lot of... I mean, in Brit Britain is, is sandwiched. I guess like Japan also, Britain is sandwiched between the American landmass and the European landmass. And it's kind of able to filter 
uh, it's able to choose which of those it pays attention to. And it, actually, it turns out it pays much more attention to the US, although it's geographically further away. But but Japan is in a similar situation because it's got China and Korea right there. It's got the Asian sort of landmass right beside it. But it's also very much a bridge to the US. It has been since the post-war period. And uh, and even before that, you know, when it opened up in the 19th century, so um, it's uh, it's able to filter the West, and it's very fascinating to me. Uh, you know, the same way you could talk about the beat boom in the early 60s, and why did the Beatles pick up on certain American records and not others? And they say that oh, you know, in Liverpool it was a port, and we got singles brought in by people coming into the port from the US, and so Japan is uh, similar. It's actually filtered. Um, you know, it gets Bossa Nova records from South America and it gets um, uh, Jean Cocteau or whatever from France, it got our movies, and then from Britain it gets other things. And, and of course, there's all sorts of different filtration going on in different parts of, you know, different parts of the city will be attuned to different parts of other countries. And, uh, but also we kind of, we're both manufacturing nations or at least nations emerging from an industrial period of manufacturing who have made money by copying the products that come into our ports and, and doing them differently or doing them better. And there's actually a, a, um, a piece in the book of Japan's, which describes how, uh, the, one of the idiots discovers, uh, a, a D metaphysicization factory. Well, I don't know what the <laughs> word is for it, but, but basically, um, he discovers a huge warehouse where products are coming in and they're being stripped of their auras because products have a certain context and meaning in one culture. And Japan has been so expert at stripping away, not just from the language, from fra English phrases on T-shirts don't mean what they meant in the West. You know, they mean something totally different in Japan or they mean nothing. They just are shapes, you know. But uh, he discovers the place where this happens. And this is based on, I think there's someone called Kato, who is a, a Jap Japanese literature historian who said that um, Japanese literature detranscendentalizes de everything that it imports from other cultures. So it's not, it's not that they don't import things and take things, but they take them and they put them in such, they filter them, strip off the soul that things have, put them in a new context, a kind of crazy paving in which they, they become Japanese. So to be Japanese, this is where I disagree again with Alex Kerr, uh, because to be Japanese is not to just use things which have been originated in Japanese society. It's how you recontextualize things from other societies that really makes you Japanese. It brings into my mind the old joke about how Japan is so good at taking things from the West and making them better and selling them back to the West. I mean, the car is often the example there, you know, giving it better fuel economy, making it smaller, improving every element of it. But Imp improving is less interesting to me than this this idea of reinterpretation you know I, having been american born having grown up in america been in america for most of my most of my years i I don't really have an interest in America as America presents it, but I do have a strong interest in America as interpreted by Europe or by Japan or by someplace else and i mean do you do you have the same feeling for Britain or for Scotland specifically? Definitely, because you see there, you see things, it's like a surprising slipping glimpse you get of, of, of things, just glimpsed at the periphery of your vision. There's also a guy called Thomas Glover, who uh, is a Scottish entrepreneur, businessman, who was actually on both sides at the, the Tokugawa sort of period. Um, and uh, But then introduced all sorts of things like... Um, um, the steam engines, for instance, trains, the first trains were, were demonstrated by him in Japan. And of course, later, Japan totally embraced railways in, in a very Japanese way. Uh, you know, now I, I like to think of when a Japanese train enters a Japanese station, there's a kind of beautiful, almost orgasmic music. And it's like the beloved is entering his, his beloved, you know, the, there's a kind of almost, almost sexual tenderness of the, the train entering the station in Japan. Um, and, but also like a Swiss, perfect Swiss mechanical accuracy to everything that all the trains really do run on time. And, uh, there's a kind of tenderness and gentleness about the rail system here. So Glover, um, introduced that. He also helped found Mitsubishi Industries because he started a dockyard, which turned into Mitsubishi. Um, he, he started the Kirin Beer Company, or rather, if you look at the Kirin beer cans and bottles, there's a little Chinese dragon with a mustache, 
a legendary Chinese beast, we're told on the label, but actually it's, um, it was drawn originally by Thomas Glover's daughter, oh. and it's, it's, it's his moustache. <laughs> the BBC is actually filming a documentary in Nagasaki right now about Glover, um, this weird Scott transplanted. I mean, it's part of, obviously, colonial and imperial history, not quite colonial because Japan was never colonized, which I think is super important because that's what makes the difference between Japan and places like Singapore and Hong Kong. Singapore and Hong Kong have this definitely post-colonial feeling, whereas Japan just does not. Partly thanks to just things like the wind, because, you know, the, the first kamikaze was the divine wind, which uh, smashed up the Chinese Navy when they were trying to colonize, colonize Japan. So it's, it's been very lucky to have avoided, through its own ingenuity and through armed warfare, but also through lucky fortune and, and, and being an island, it's managed to avoid being colonized. It's a bit like Britain. Now, I've mentioned in very brief earlier, the one of the things I found most interesting in the Book of Scotland, the previous book in this series, well, not in this series, but the previous one you've done in this series, the Book of Scotland. And I I found quite fascinating reading a few, a few writings on originally Japan that you had written with, as I mentioned, Scottish nouns subbed in. You know, it's transposition of writings on Japan to Scotland. And one of the concepts that pops up in one of those exercises and one of the concepts that pops into one of the characters' mouths in the Book of Japan's is this idea of super legitimacy, which on Click Opera you wrote about originally in the context of a train driver who was so so striving for perfection, so embodying his job that it's, it was something that nobody from the West could even imagine happening. How do you think of super, legitimately, super legitimacy today? Yeah, I, I still, I sit on trains and I still think, wow, I, I really see super legitimacy right in front of me happening in that seat opposite. Or Yeah, I do really feel that that's a, a good word. I, I think it's a shame that the, I think the Wikipedia entry on it was deleted, or maybe that was another another thing that I, a term that I came up with. Maybe that was cute formalism and they deleted it as non-notable. <laughs> um, but I think super legitimacy really, I mean, it's not just about a government wrestling to establish authority. It's also about people having a, the society taking the place of God uh, in the West. Uh, we, we, we think of God is being outside society and being a court of appeal that we can go to if society is treating us badly. We can say, well, we still have God on our side. We can still, there's a whole code of ethics which, is, which comes from God and not the state, etc., etc. That just doesn't apply in, in Asian societies at all. The society itself is absolutely vast and inescapable. And the, the idea is that to be free, you don't opt out of society. You don't rebel against it. You opt in and you totally embrace your social role. And freedom comes from recognizing that you are totally a social being. This makes me think about some uh, about a, th a thought about Japan that I've that I have thought of as resonant uh, sort of between what you've written about Japan and what what Donald Ritchie has which it's the idea that in Japan and this is this is from Donald Ritchie this is how he puts it in Japan surfaces are not something at odds with reality you don't have reality and then surfaces you have reality which includes surfaces. I mean, maybe, you, maybe you've read him write on this before, but is that an idea that has a currency with you as well? Yeah, I think so very much. This is fascinating as well that you, you walk down. I mean, I'm living right next to a road called Ota Road, which is short for otaku, which is obviously the hobbyist fanatic uh, Japanese stereotype. And it's a very real uh, stereotype. There are many otaku. Um, so when I walk along Ota Road, I see basically what Freud would say is the unconscious actually aren't blazoned on the, um, the outsides of the stores, hanging on flags uh, or dressed up and maids in frilly costumes are standing all along the street, uh, enticing people into parlors where they can, they can be treated like kings and massaged and all sorts of other ego um, trips they can have for money. Um, and I, I think um, I think a lot of what Lacan, I think it's Jacques Lacan, the psychoanalyst, said that Japan cannot be psychoanalyzed because there is nothing hidden. There's nothing to discover when, if you root around in the unconscious or in dreams or in memories. Um, it's all up on the surface. Incest and all sorts of terrible things are there on the surface. And there, um, there isn't really shame. Again, shame is a, a kind of Protestant concept, or rather guilt. Let's distinguish between guilt and shame um, in Ruth Benedict uh, distinction there. Guilt is a sense of personal um, mortification that you feel in, in relation to your personal relationship with God, which is the Protestant uh, attitude to, to God. Um, shame is about 
society that you only feel shame on cue when you've been exposed as doing something wrong. And at that point, you really demonstrate your shame in a great display. People often go on television in Japan weeping, uh, saying they're so sorry for whatever they did, building buildings without the earthquake um, uh, regulation strength or whatever. Um, they will go on and make public confessions and then um, they're sort of exonerated and they can, once they've done that and they've made, made a demonstration of their sense of shame, they can be reintegrated and, and re-accepted after a little period of disappearing from the public view. So um, shame is really all about making a theatrical display which uh, shows your bona fides, but isn't really, it doesn't have to be something you personally feel. It's fine five minutes after making that TV appearance to go and dry your tears and be perfectly happy and drink and laugh with your friends. If you're just tuning in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas, and I'm Colin Marshall. My guest is Nick Curry, better known as Momus, musician, artist, writer, author of the new book, The Book of Japan's, the second that he's written for Sternberg Press's Solution series. The first was The Book of Scotland's. He's also just moved, by the way, from Berlin to Osaka, Japan, so he's reporting directly from the land about which the idiots of his novel speculate. If you want to hear this conversation again after the broadcast, to visit Colin Marshall Radio. Dot com or go to iTunes and search for the Marketplace of Ideas in the iTunes Store. Either way, you'll get complete, unbridled access to the Marketplace of Ideas interview archive. Download them all freely to your computer, your iPod, your Zoom, whatever you got. You can listen to the Marketplace of Ideas on it. If you have any kind of feedback whatsoever on the program, questions, comments, guest suggestions, don't hesitate to send those along to Colin, C O L I N at colinmarshallradio.com. And that is Colin at colinmarshallradio.com. Now back to the conversation with Nick Curry on the Marketplace of Ideas, cultural conversation of the depth you demand. There's, some, there's something that I can't, can't, I've never quite figured out about this, then, is that, is this, is this a way that other societies or even non-Japanese people can can become or is this 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 surfaces as a part of reality that can't be separated is is that something that is just so tied into japan that it is japan's alone i've been socialized in britain uh, i spend a lot of time watching old documentaries on the bbc here in japan about uh, britain in the 50s and 60s and i kind of recognize that society as the one that really i'm formatted and it's really almost impossible for me to break out of that formatting but what i can do is i can admire and maybe this is all just part of my formatting because it's part of the romantic legacy not just rebellion is romantic but also exoticization of other societies is really a hallmark of romantic thinking so I'm just a Western guy in the same way that, you know, um, people at the end of the 19th century suddenly found Japan fascinating because it was this idealized, aestheticized society. I, I'm just another exoticizer. Uh, and and I, I have disagreements with the Edward Said line about um, uh, Orientalism because I think Orientalism is inevitable and even has a, has a positive side which is that it's, it's fine to say that somebody else's differences from you are cool. It's fine to talk about the good other. What is a problem is when you start talking about the other as a bad other, you know, and you start saying that differences are a problem and that we ought to have a global society which is all the same. That's really my great enemy is this monoculture, the idea that everybody that there is a correct way of doing things, whether it's business or serving food or whatever it is, that, and that this way should dominate throughout the world because that's really set us up for huge disasters whether it's you know things like the green revolution and suddenly you find that uh, the strain of wheat that you told everybody across the whole world to grow is susceptible to some new blight and then suddenly there's no wheat in the world you know there are huge problems with monoculture on a on a, an agricultural level or on a social anthropological level we can't have monoculture we need to have diversity and diversity means getting things wrong uh, in a lot of people's minds you have to have the courage to to get things wrong or to say you're doing that wrong but i respect your right to do that wrong because it, it makes things more diverse this gets me into the the speculative japans that the the idiots discuss having allegedly visited by crawling into the wombs of cows once more in the in the book of japan's now the, these are usually fairly far flung into the future japans and they're they're never correct me if i'm wrong about it but they're never japans that have submitted to some kind of world monoculture it is always the japan they describe is always 
a different Japan. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah, I suppose that that, that was my interest was、um, because it followed on from the Book of Scotland, and the Book of Scotland is about hey, we have an independence. Process for Scotland.、Uh, let's look at the ways Scotland could be even more Scottish and and could really discover its identity in the future. It wasn't about how Scotland could become airstrip one for America. Although the, I think there are a couple of Scotlands where where Scotland does knuckle under to somebody else's empire.、Right. But I, th- I think.、Um, The Japan book. I, I suppose I think of it as a similar situation. It's not that Japan is going to become politically independent from some dominant nation like Scotland is, but but Japan is entering a new period of sakoku, which is the isolation that it was in when when it was in the nineteenth century and before, and it, it wasn't really communicating with the West. I do feel quite strongly that Japan is trying to. It's becoming almost autistic. And there was a report on the BBC last week about this and how Japan should open up and embrace outsiders,、uh, increase its immigration levels, and all the rest of it. And of course, I can understand why, especially a, a neoliberal. I think it was the econ- economics、um, editor at the BBC had gone round interviewing some expat Japanese who had been brought up in the West and who were all banging the drum for Japan opening up its business to Western business models to so-called reform, which of course it just means you know giving. People like Rupert Murdoch more control. Rupert Murdoch was seen off in Japan last decade. He was not given access to the satellite TV here, which I think is a great thing. Now, now that we see what Rupert Murdoch has been up to, that's a great <laughs> thing for Japan that they were able to resist it. So I'm actually rather perversely on the side of the new Sakoku. I mean, I can see the downside of it too. Part of it might be that they would really close the doors, and people like me wouldn't even be allowed into Japan. Who knows? But I do think that. I do see Japan as a kind of laboratory where they should be cooking up weird,、um, weird alternatives. I mean, in a way, this is it could be a terrible burden to bear for any society that it would have to be just just cooking up alternatives to the monoculture. But I do think Japan is our greatest hope for not just weirdness,、uh, social weirdness, which also works economically and also manages to make people rich, because they are very weird people who are also very rich people. I mean, that's in itself pretty pretty interesting. But also that it would be、um, a society that would pioneer post-industrial living, because they're like Britain; they've come through their industrial revolution,、um, and they're coming out of it. And、uh, China has bested them, just as the U.S. bested Britain. And、um, now, what we have to do in Britain and Japan is kind of find out how to how to downsize, how to shrink、uh, demographically and economically. In ways which are positive, which are elegant, which are about quality of life, and and you quote you quote Ryuichi Sakamoto in the Book of Japan's saying something to this effect, and I have the page open right now. In fact, he says, you know, I think it'd be better if Japan became a beautiful third-rate country. It'd be nice if Japan was a place of delicious food, beautiful scenery, and abundant nature. If that were the case, I think it wouldn't matter if one had little money. Now that that's a quote you can I take it directly endorse. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a beautiful vision of a、um, slow life or post-industrial、um, or even post-capitalist Japan. You know, Japan is a weirdly conflicted society that's a little bit communistic, but also very capitalistic at the same time. It's got a lot of business and a lot of、um, enterprise here, and a lot of inventiveness and innovation. But at the same time, the social structure continues to be perversely communistic. They don't want to be—they、uh, don't want a big gap between the wealthy and the and the poor or, or the middle class. They feel that they're very different, and、uh, there's almost an national egocentrism. Now, this connection—this connection between Japan as a laboratory for possible realities and art as a laboratory for possible realities—that we discussed last time we talked as well—and I mean for. for For all I know, Scotland as a as a lab for possible realities. I mean, this is this is all different branches on one tree, as it were. Correct? Yeah. And I want to know what I, I guess how how wide how wide is the applicability of this idea to you? You know, when this this idea of of people, places, things, operations, ways of creating, ways of living, using those things as as laboratories. I mean, how far can you take this? How how many how 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 wide scale or small scale can you go with the idea of 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 do, doing things in a way that is more that is more experimental in the almost literal sense of the term? Well, I think it's going to happen anyway. I mean, we're living in a time of increasing technological change, and、um, uh, what's his name, Craig Venter, is it、um, the DNA people? I yes, mean, things yes, are happening.、Yes. 
things are happening really quickly that are going to really change the quality of all existence on this planet. And, and if we're not making those innovations, somebody else will, and somebody else will be copywriting them. I mean, I have real problems with the copyright system, intellectual property system, because of course that's all about, you know, uh, sort of trying to control and exploit these uh, laboratory discoveries. But the kind of discoveries that I'm talking about are much more in, in terms of social structure, just the way we think about things, the way we think about what it means to be Scottish or American or Japanese or whatever. Those are also discoveries that, that they don't have the... They don't have the immediate impact of scientific discoveries, but I think they're just as important in the long term. So um, cities like Berlin, where I, I was living for the last eight years, are really now focused on becoming laboratories for, for thinking about culture and how we can change things. Basically, magnets for artists uh, who are all about, you know, writing and formatting the 21st century and, and beyond. So I, I really do believe in that. The idea of an avant-garde, I do believe that there's a self-selected group of people. This is going to sound sort of fanatical and crazy, but I think there's a, a self-selected group of people who uh, know that this is their duty to come up with new ways to live because most people are, are really quite conservative. And I think Marshall McLuhan said this, you know, people, the reason that um, art, which is really just based in the present technology, can seem futuristic is that most people in their art tastes are consuming the art of the past and they're still, they're still living through the revolution of, you know, post-impressionism right now when other people, are, other people are saying, well, you know, that's from a century ago. We need, to, we need to make new art, not just for the present, but also for the future. So I kind of do believe in this mission, this narcissistic and egocentric mission of artists to congregate in certain places, you know, whether it's um, Queens or, wherever, or, or Berlin or... Uh, you know, wherever, and, and actually just be really, hang out with each other, be unbearably pretentious, and but also, and do drugs or whatever they have to do. I personally don't do drugs. I just speculate feverishly uh, in, in my room, but uh, whatever it takes, you know, to actually bust out of the, the boring, habit-bound, conventional ways of thinking and, and make up right new societies. But of course, you have to bring people along with you. This is where it gets difficult because you can, laboratories are places where anything can happen, including all sorts of toxic explosions and dangerous situations. Then the point is people saying, well, do we really need this new invention? Do we really want it? Do we want our society to go in that way? And that, at that point, it opens up to a much wider conversation. And whether I'm reading your writing or I'm listening to your music, I, I think about the theme of, of yes, finding one's own reality, sort of figuring out what reality works best for oneself. And I, I have the Book of Scotland's open to Scotland 18, which is a, a, a very sturdy looking block of text where the you have the voice of the book say that the Scotland of his dreams, it's it's like a Stirling University crossed with an enormous late night shopping center crossed with Chinatown with I mean, all sorts of things, branches of habitat, bars run by noise musicians, mazes, zoos, mad houses, 70s style hotels for the nomenclatura, uh, neolithic thick roundhouses, yellow chickens extending to the horizon, all this uh, kabuki theaters, uh, wax museums, and all, all this stuff. It's a very, to me, a very appealing, a very appealing <laughs> reality. I don't know if this voice is your voice, but whatever this is, I was like, wow, you know, I like, I like what I'm reading. And I want to know with, with the reality you want to exist in, what, what can you say about it? What are the qualities of the sort of reality you have, you have wanted to pursue in your life? There are just certain, there are certain moments when, I mean, like I say, I've never done drugs really of any kind, but there are certain moments when something happens in your brain, when you, you get a little glimpse of something, maybe, maybe it's a mixture of a reality and a dream or a certain smell triggers a, an idea and you get a, a sense of a, a parallel world in which not only are you happy, but uh, amazing shapes and new, new fruits are, are there for you to eat, to pluck from the tree. I just discovered a new fruit, actually, recently. And that's one great thing about coming to a new country. I went to the supermarket and I picked up a pack of what I thought were um, kaki fruits, which is like persimmons. But they turned out to be this thing called biwa, which is a thing called the locat, actually. In the West, it's called the locat, and which is a, a funny fruit, um, which became suddenly my new favorite fruit. So, you know, in, in, as a middle-aged man, it's kind of, you don't expect to find a new favorite fruit. It's like discovering a new color. But I did because because I went to a Japanese supermarket and just randomly chose something. So, you know, I, I, those moments are really uh, fascinating. And, and I suppose if monoculture is like the, the, the bugbear for me, also um, habit is, I, I don't want my habits to just take me, you know, 
on a, on a direct line to death without ever experiencing anything new. I do want there to be moments of revelation and moments where when you're a baby, you must be processing so much new information. Your brain must be so interesting at that point. And then little by little, you close down those, you lose brain cells for a start. Babies have like 5 billion brain cells and adults have a lot fewer than that. But um, also your, the freshness of your experience can start to close down if you're not careful. So I've really spent a lot of time in my life trying to move from Paris to New York to, to Japan, trying to always bust out of my habits and to, to just get the sense of being alive, you know. And that involves, that involves exposure to things I really hate. Like I really hate flying. I really hate mm -hmm. being in an airplane. But I, but, I, but I spend a lot of time in airplanes just gr gritting my teeth and knowing that at least this will bust me into a new way of experiencing life. I think of the concept, the Zen Buddhist concept of beginner's mind, and I, I have never heard you put much store by Buddhism, Zen or otherwise, but is that also similar to, to the kind of the way, you, do, is that something you want to maintain, whether by Buddhist methods or otherwise? It sounds like otherwise in your case, but do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I probably got most of that Buddhist um, teaching through secondhand through 60s artists, you know, Ginsburg and John Cage, and people who talked a lot about um Buddhism, um, yeah, I haven't studied Buddhism directly, but but I, whenever I encounter these ideas from it, I, I do think, wow, they really they were there first, and they're right. <laughs> now, do you ever now that you're in Japan and and living in Osaka? I mean, do you do you get the sense that Japan for the Westerner can provide a long term fount of of beginner's mind just because you are a Westerner in this culture that has a lot of delightful incompatibilities uh, with with whichever one you came from. I mean, and I'm going to bring up Donald Ritchie's uh, observation that you know he he writes about being saddened a bit that Japan has turned inward, as you mentioned, and that you, it's no longer as cool to be a foreigner there. You can't make friends necessarily simply by being a foreigner. So he laments that. But I mean, do you think the Japan of today, the one you live in, is can can drive can still drive that sort of beginner's mind by itself, nonetheless? I think it can, but like anywhere else, you um, you do develop habits, and um, and those are your enemies in a sense. Uh, although I, I am kind of fascinated with the idea of um, of having exotic habits. I, I guess it's, it's almost paradoxical. Like how could your how could your habits continue to feel exotic if they were habits? But uh, for a certain time, you can like if you have the habit to go to the centre, the bathhouse, and sit under a, a kind of mountain stream like fountain of water um, or go into the steam room, those can become habits in the short term. And then, then you might be in a different life in a different city after that. And you would think, wow, how could that have been my habit to go to such a strange place as that steam room and sit with those old men with towels over us naked, you know, in a room together. But yeah, uh, as soon as things become habits, you know, habit is a great deadener, as Samuel Beckett said. And, and uh, I don't want that deadening. Um, but I do kind of want... Um, I do want a domestic relationship with the exotic. I think that's interesting, but it, it can only last a certain amount of time. So I, I, my solution is to leave Japan every three months or something, to go back into the West, to immerse myself. I was just in London last month for a month. And then when I come back to Japan, everything's kind of fresh again. And if you were to write a third book in the Solution series, and you're writing it in Japan, it couldn't be about Japan, could it? No, it couldn't be about Japan in Japan. No, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I would love to write another book of some kind, but I don't know what it would be. I was thinking it might be about austerity, the book of austerity, um, and just be about it's actually some of the things I've seen in Nishinari, but it, I don't think I would give it a specifically Japanese setting. It could just as well be something like George Orwell's Down and Out in Paris and London. Um, it would just be about the idea of getting by with less because uh, we live in a time of, you know, where, in which the word austerity is like a buzzword and it's really what it means in shorthand is the uh, international markets demanding sacrifices from ordinary people so that they can continue making huge profits. That's, a, that's really what austerity is when it comes to Greece or Portugal or other countries being asked to pass austerity packages. But there is also a, a positive side of austerity that it might be... Uh, it might be a way to consume less than we consume currently. We consume way too much. If we all consume to the level, if we all get as rich as Americans are currently, uh, and it looks like India and China are definitely headed that way, we would need several planets. We'd need, I think, six or seven planets just to supply the raw resources for that lifestyle. So that's not sustainable. And we have to really think about how to be austere uh, in a... In a uh, 
a pleasurable way, you know, how to be austere in a way that people will want to embrace. I've been speaking with Nick Curry, also known as Momus, the author of now three books, two in the Sternberg Press Solution series, The Book of Scotland's and The Book of Japan's more recently. Also, the new album out this year, unfortunately, didn't get to talk about Thunderclown, but it is out. And from what I've heard, I'm quite fascinated by it. Nick, thanks so much again for taking the time to come on the program. Thank you, Colin. If you'd like to learn more about the Book of Japan's and Nick Momus Curry, visit his website at imomus, I-M-O-M-U-S, dot com. This has been the Marketplace of Ideas, and I've been Colin Marshall. You can hear this show again in a podcast form at colinmarshallradio.com or on the iTunes store. Just search for the Marketplace of Ideas either place. You will get the complete archive. The website of Ben Althaus, the man who's produced our theme music, is available, as always, at benalthaus.com. Com. And if you want weekly updates on all things Marketplace of Ideas, it is no more difficult than signing up in, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five seconds for the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list. Go to colinmarshallradio.com, click the Marketplace of Ideas logo, and there on the front page are the oh-so-simple instructions on how you, too, can get weekly deliveries to your inbox of news on current Marketplace of Ideas interviews, upcoming Marketplace of Ideas interviews, and other related interestingness on the Internet. That's the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list. Details at colinmarshallradio.com. And any questions, comments, or feedback you have, please do send that along to colin, C-O-L-I-N, at colinmarshallradio.com as well. Thanks for tuning in. As always, we'll catch you next time on the Marketplace of Ideas for more cultural conversation of the depth you demand.